on with uh, sampling distributions and confidence intervals. We're getting into the confidence interval realm here. And this is the ever awesome PhD comics. The sampling distribution of the mean, to remind you, is the distribution of all possible sample means taken with random sampling and a very specific sample size for each of those samples from a population with a specific mean that we know and a specific population or population standard deviation that we know or that we can estimate these things if we don't know them. And we calculate the mean of each of these samples. So the distribution of all possible sample means with those sort of conditions or, or assumptions or circumstances. So what is this distribution good for? It's good for finding probabilities of particular sample means or means within particular ranges occurring. So to reiterate, uh, this, here's this situation we talked about a little while ago, slightly modified. Here's, some, here's the population of all possible GRE scores. They have a mean of 500, a standard deviation of 100, at least in the old school system they did. You're hearing crazy cranking weird sounds there. Probably because I'm doing things to my microphone here. Anyway, so it has this known population and the uh, known population characteristics. So what's the sampling distribution of means for n equals 4 from this population? That sampling distribution is going to look like this, a little bit skinnier, because the sample size tells you how big the standard deviation should be. The standard deviation of this sampling distribution of means is 100 divided by the square root of the sample size, the square root of 4. 100 because that's the original standard deviation of the raw scores, and you use that divided by the sample size to find the standard deviation of the distribution of means. So in this case, it's 50. There you go. And the z-scores are much more squished in. Now, 1 to 1 is right here, but you go down here, 1 to 1, negative 1 to positive 1 is a wider area. So that's uh, just showing us what happens with a smaller standard deviation. Of course, z-scores are just number of standard deviations from the mean, so you cover more uh, z-score area in one of these distributions versus the other very clearly. So here we have the same distribution, but now a different sample size. And the sampling distribution of this, uh, for this sample size is noticeably skinnier because we had to divide by the standard deviation of a larger number to find the standard deviation. So now there's a sample size or a standard deviation of 25. So the standard error is 25 here. And the distribution of z-scores is much more squished in. Now between the numbers that in the original raw score distribution gave you approximately negative 1 and positive 1, you have almost negative 4 and positive 4. You have a huge portion of the of the area curve or of the normal curve contained within what was just 68% of the scores now. So there's a big reduction there. And here's what those two sampling distributions look like overlaid on top of each other and with the original distribution in case you were deeply cur curious about that because I, I know I was. So now we have a larger sample size, a sample size of 400, which gives us a much skinnier distribution. So this the standard error now is only 5. So the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of means, or the standard error of the mean, is 5 now. 5 down from 100. It's 1 20th the size that it was before. And the standard and the uh, z-scores are super squished in now. Much more squished in. Almost all of those means are going to be found within a pretty narrow range uh, on either side of the population mean there. So this is a a representation of n equals 16 and n equals 400 compared to the original population. The original population, well, we had to make this so tall so you could see how tall this one is here, that the original population is really looking pretty low and flat there. Believe me, it's still normal though. It just is really hard to see when it's so squished down like that. So, <laughs> more jokes about stats. Now on to confidence intervals. Let's talk about how we do those. What is a confidence interval? It's the middle part of a sampling distribution. The end, that's pretty much it. That's a confidence interval. But you can interpret it a lot of different ways. It has many different meanings depending on your perspective. And all these meanings are valid. It's a measure of how precise our measure est our, our estimation method is. And this includes all sorts of stuff, like what measures we used and what um, stats we used to come up with our, our measures of center and how much variability there is in the phenomenon. It, so it includes all the things that we talked about in class that meant that affect the size of confidence intervals. Smaller is more precise. It's also a reverse z-score problem. 
where we say find the middle 95% or whatever, the dividing points in the normal distribution, um, if we give you the mean and the standard deviation. And it's, we, you have the area, 95%, and you need to find the two raw scores, or at least scores that are in the scale of the raw scores, are actually means, hypothetical means, that would divide that middle 95% from everything else. We can roughly estimate a 95% confidence interval, which is plus or minus two standard errors, because the z-score for 95% of in the center of a normal distribution is 1.96, so negative to positive 1.96 z-score gives you uh, almost, well, it gives you 95%, and so plus or minus two standard errors gives you slightly more than 95%. So we can say it's approximately 95%, and we can use that to demonstrate how to, use, how to make confidence intervals. So let's look back at this distribution. The raw scores have a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. We have our sampling distribution that has a standard error of 50. So now if we want an approximate 95% confidence interval, we just have to go two standard errors up from the mean and two standard errors down from the mean. On those two numbers are our confidence interval. A standard error is 50, so two standard errors down is 50 and 50, so it's down to 400. And one standard error up is 550, and two standard errors up is 600. So we usually express this without referring to this com to this sampling distribution that we did. I mean, mentally it's all happening there, and in the math it's all happening, but we usually express our answer just as if it was just right there with the sample values. We say our mean is 500, and our confidence interval is 400 to 600. Now I use the squiggle equals because it's not exactly that, but we'll talk about exactly what it is in a minute. So here's another situation. Sample size of 16, which gives us a standard error of 25. What's an approximate 95% conf confidence interval for the same mean if we have um, a sample size of 16 instead of 4? It's going to be smaller, right? Because the standard deviation is smaller, this distribution is smaller, there's more area contained within a smaller space on the number line. So it's going to be two standard deviations down and two standard deviations up. So two standard deviations down will be 50 points down from 50 from 500, and two standard deviations up will be 50 points up from 500. So we would report our sample mean was 500, and our 95% confidence interval was approximately 450 to 550. So now that confidence interval is half the size of the other one. Wait, half? Anyway, smaller. So let's look at this again, but now with the huge sample size, n equals 400. You know, the standard error here is 5. So the approximate 95% confidence interval is tiny. It's just two standard errors up and two standard errors down. But now a standard error is only 5 points. Now my graph might not be exactly to scale because it gets pretty hard to squish everything in there. So our approximate 95% confidence interval now is 490 to 510. So if we had taken a sample of students who took the GRE, and we had 400 GRE scores, and our mean was 500, we would say our best estimate of the true population mean of GRE scores is 500, 95% confidence interval, approximately 490 to 510. That's how we would report that. So getting more precise, we should use the real Z scores, not that approximation of plus or minus two standard deviations, because that doesn't give you exactly 95%. You need plus or minus 1.96 in any normal distribution, plus or minus 1.96 standard deviations on either side of the mean will give you 95%, or very close to 95% of the, of the uh, area of that distribution. So applied to the sampling distribution of means, that's what we need to do. We need to do 1.96 standard errors on either side of the mean, and that will give us uh, our 95% confidence interval. So going back to these examples, sample size of four, where the standard error was 50, we will go 1.96 50s, and then 1.96 50s up. So the real 95% confidence interval, we'd have to go 500 and count down 1.96 times 50, which isn't going to be quite the same as 2 times 50. So we're not going to quite go down to 400. We're not going to go down to 550 and 400, or sorry, 450 and 400. We're not going to quite make it, because 1.96 isn't quite big enough for that. And we're going to go up, and we're not going to quite make it to 600. So. When we calculate that confidence interval, we're going to go 1.96 standard errors down and 1.96 standard errors up, and that will give us a confidence interval of 402 to 598, and that's our actual 95% confidence interval. So here, when we had sample size of 16, 
and the standard error was 25, then we do the same thing. Oops, into the real 95% confidence interval. Now 1.96 standard errors is, is smaller because a standard error is only 25. We need 1.96 of those below 500 and 1.96 of those above 500. So to work that out, you'd say 500 minus 1.96 times 25. So you'd subtract from 500 1.96 times 25, and then you'd add to 500 1.96 times 25. So your 95% confidence interval would be 451 to 549. And then here with a huge sample size, it gave us a standard error that was very tiny of only five 1.96 standard errors, 1.965s below and 1.965s above, gives us a confidence interval that is actually 490.2 and 509.8. So we can change the confidence level. We can make that middle percent any percent we want, but the most common ones are 90 and 99 percent. So what are the z-scores that capture the middle 90 percent or 99 percent? For a fun exercise, if you haven't done this before. <laughs> I'm a statist statistician type person telling you fun exercise. Anyway, to help understand this a little bit more, look that up in the normal curve table if you haven't already done this or if you don't already know the answer. If you're having fun using R, you can do this. You can say Q norm 0.05 lower tail equals false. The Q norm function tells you areas in the, um, or sorry, it tells you values. So you give it the area, which is 0.05 there, and that's going to be for 90%, so 5% in each tail. So that'll tell you the, Z, the negative Z score, and then you can just take the negative and the positive of that, and that'll be your Z score for 90%. Uh, for 95%, you can do this, and it'll give you negative 1.96. And then you can say negative and positive 1.96 will give you a 95% confidence interval if you use those as z-scores. And then for 99%, if you do this, it'll give you the answer for the negative version. And then you take the negative and the positive version of whatever z-score this gives you, and that should be your 99% z-score. Those are the z-scores you would use to find these confidence intervals. So a 90% confidence interval has a different z-score. It's 1.65 or 1.645. So you only do about one and two-thirds standard errors now down and up from the mean. So it's going to be smaller than a 95% confidence interval. So if you work through this problem using the confidence interval formula or just seat of your pants brute force logic, which should work if you're thinking through things carefully and you've really worked out what's going on so far, then this is the confidence interval that you get for a 90% confidence interval for the mean in this case. 99% will be bigger, although I think I used a different standard error here. So 99%, you need to use probably 2.58 as the z-score to multiply instead of 1.96 or 1.65. And that's going to be bigger. It's going to cover more of the area in the sampling distribution of means. And it'll be a confidence interval of 43 point, or 435.5 to 564.5, I believe. So here's a 99% confidence interval for a ridiculously high sample size, where we have the standard error of only 5. You have a little more than two and a half standard errors on either side. And our confidence interval is still pretty small, 487.1 to 512.9. So just flashing back here, this is the thought experiment for confidence intervals. You collect a sample, and then you calculate the mean, and you note the sample size. You imagine very specifically zillions of samples with a sample size that's the same as your sample size. And that's the sampling distribution of means. You specify the mean of the sampling distribution of means, and you just say that's the same as the mean of the population. And your best estimate of what the mean of the population is is the mean of your sample, because you have no idea. You're looking for the population mean. You don't know what it is. Your best estimate is your sample mean. So you just plug in your sample mean and say, the sampling distribution of the means mean is the same as my sample mean. And then you specify the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, and that's the standard deviation of the population raw scores divided by the square root of your sample size and your sample. Now, you might be noticing you have to know what this is or this doesn't work, and we'll deal with that later. But yeah, you do have to know what that is or else it doesn't work. And then you find the middle 95% or 90% or 99% of that sampling distribution of means, and you just report the two numbers, the dividing points for that middle percent, the lower limit and the upper limit. And then your conclusion is something like we are 95% confident that mu, meaning the true population mean, lies between, and then you report your numbers, you know, 550 and, you know, 650, or whatever those numbers are that you have there. Now, 
we implicitly assume that the mean of the population is the mean of the sample, which is kind of crazy, <laughs> because it's not, but it's a useful assumption, and it's a reasonable assumption, because what else do we have to go on? It's the only reasonable assumption we can make, because all we have is the sample mean. And it's also very useful, because what we really want to do is estimate our precision of measurement sometimes. And so we just want to say, starting from my sample mean, how precise is that measurement? How far to the top and the bottom on the number line do I have to go to get you know, a, a specific confidence level, like 95% confidence level, for where the true population might lie? And that tells you how precisely you've, been, you've done your measuring. Anyway, we'll talk about more, more about this in more lectures, but we're done for now.